Hello everyone, I am the Man at Kirby, and welcome to my channel, The Commander Tavern. The Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic Gathering format. The brewery is a series on this channel showcasing my spicy brews and other deck techs. On this 8th season premiere of the brewery, I will be discussing one of the two face commanders from the Kamagawa Neon Dynasty Precons, Shorikai Genesis Engine, as voted on by viewers a couple of weeks ago. If you like this deck or any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout the video, please consider using my TCG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find that link down in the description. It will really help out the channel. The best way you can help support the channel is with my Patreon. For just $1, patrons get early access to certain videos on YouTube. In fact, patrons got a chance to see this video earlier. There are many other benefits to being a patron, so check them out. You can also support my channel for free by simply liking, subscribing, and sharing, which also helps out a lot. You can join my Discord server for free if you want to join the Commander Tavern community. All pertinent links are down in the description. Alright, let's get back to the episode. Shorikai is an 8-8 legendary vehicle with crew 8 for 2 generic, 1 white, and 1 blue. It has the clause of being able to be used as your commander, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about it as the deck's commander. It has an activated ability where you pay 1 and tap it, drawing 2 cards and discarding 1. You also create a 1-1 pilot creature token when you do. While it'll certainly take a while to crew Shorikai, even if you're just using the pilots it creates to do so, Making it a potential Voltron commander, Shorikai is actually has a better purpose as a combo engine. It's even in its name. That being said, while the deck does make the most of Shorikai as a combo piece in the command zone, it also makes the most of other strategies with it that potentially overlap, never truly giving your opponents a firm grasp on how you're going to defeat them. So let's start off with the main function of Shorikai combo engine. Not only does it draw us cards, but it also creates fodder in the form of 1-1 creature tokens. Therefore, it's incredibly easy to go infinite with Ashnet's Altar and Intruder Alarm. Each time Shorikai is tapped to create the pilot, the pilot entering the battlefield triggers Intruder Alarm, untapping Shorikai, assuming Shorikai has been crewed, of course. Then, you sacrifice the pilot token to Ashnet's Altar to generate two colorless mana, of which one is used to once again pay for Shorikai's activated ability, starting the combo all over. This also has the byproduct of infinite colorless mana. You can also use Phyrexian Altar as a substitute for Ashnet's Altar in this combo, but you will be using the same mana generated to activate Shorikai. Thus, you won't have infinite mana afterwards. That being said, you'd still draw into your entire deck and get infinite death triggers, infinite creature ETB triggers, etc. However, I am not running this Altar in my build, but you can if you wanted to. Talarian Kraken can be substituted for Intruder Alarm if you have Ashnet's Altar. When you draw the card with Shorikai, you pay for the Kraken's triggered ability with the extra colorless mana the altar generated, thus untapping Shorikai. While this can substitute Intruder Alarm, it will only work with Ashnet's altar, since it generates the two colorless needed to pay for both Shorikai and the Kraken. Either way, the Kraken is still a good include, since you can just pay its cost to untap Shorikai if it were crewed in order to activate it again. So even if you're not going infinite, it's still providing synergy. Since these combos can go infinite, we can potentially delay decking ourselves thanks to Library of Lang. Since the discarding is not a part of Shorikai's activation cost, Library of Lang lets us put that discarded card on top of our library instead. So do we be drawing only one net card with each activation of Shorikai? This might seem counterproductive, but at the very least, it helps us not lose a card we want to keep, as well as helping us not burn too deep through our library if we were to deck ourselves before winning. Plus, it also gives us a limitless hand, as well as protecting us from opponents making us discard cards. As for actually preventing us from decking ourselves, Ulamog the Infinite Gyre and Cosselect Butcher of Truth do so in spades. Once we have our infinite engine going and are drawing into our whole library, since we have to discard a card each time, we can simply discard one of these Eldrazi Titans in order to shuffle our graveyard back into our library, giving us more gas. Or, if you wanted to use the potentially infinite colorless mana generated by Ashnet's Altar and Intruder Alarm, you could hard cast these as well if you don't want to win by pure combo. It's up to you. However, Elixir of Immortality works just as well if the Eldrazi Titans are out of your budget. Since you are generating infinite mana with Ashnet's Altar, you can very easily cast this in between Shorikai activations, activate it, and then continue on with the loop. Keep in mind that you are drawing more cards than you're discarding, so this is the only delaying the inevitable. As for winning with the combo, Thassa's Oracle, Laboratory Maniac, and Jace Wielder of Mysteries are very viable win cons, especially if you're decking yourself. In response to Thassa's Oracle hitting the battlefield, you can activate Shorikai, starting the combo, and then stop before you draw from an empty library. Drawing your whole deck means having all the responses in hand needed. While this is a viable win con, I do not run it in my build since I've seen enough Thoracle wins and I'm quite bored of it. So I don't run it. That being said, if that sort of thing is your bag, go for it. I will make no judgments. 
For the other two, you'd have to have them already in play before comboing off, making sure to have the amount of interaction in hand necessary to protect them. If they die in response to decking yourself, you lose the game. However, as I just mentioned with Thoracle, I'm not running the other two either. But if you want to, go for it. They will certainly end the game in your favor once you're comboing off. Ominous Seize is one of the deck's win cons that a bit off the beaten path in terms of what you can do with such an engine, since people tend to gravitate towards Thoracle, Lab Man, etc. presented with the potential to deck themselves. Though, as I just mentioned, you can do that if you wanted to. However, this card is unassuming at first, until you assemble your combo and start cranking out a healthy supply of Krakens at the beginning of the end step before yours. It's also cheap enough to cast super early, so you can still get some incidental 8-8 Kraken tokens even when not going infinite with Shorikai, so it still provides value. Psychosis Crawler is another one of the deck's win cons once the combo is assembled. It's simple and will outright win you if no one can stop it. You just have to be careful with that life gain opponent if they have more life than you have cards in your library. Even then, its power and toughness is equal to the number of cards in your hand, so if you're able to keep a fat hand, you can also swing into opponents for the win. With some of the Voltron support pieces in the deck, it's certainly viable. Same with Gene Taller. While it's not necessarily a win con, if you drew enough cards where its power is enough to take out an opponent, you can definitely do so. With some very grindy games, it's important to have multiple routes to victory if you have some of your win cons exiled, stolen, etc. It's also just a good card in general in the deck. It's not that even hard to cast here either. Psychic Corrosion can also win us the game by just drawing into our library before decking ourselves. Since our opponents are being milled at twice the rate we're drawing into our libraries, we can potentially empty their library before we draw our last card, thus winning us the game at each following draw step. Or we can use our infinite colorless mana to potentially deck an opponent with either Blue Sun's Zenith, Commander's Insight, Drown in Dreams, and Stroke of Genius. Not only are these cards amazing on their own, since we can sink our mana into them at the beginning of the end turn before ours to draw a healthy amount of cards, but with infinite colorless mana to sink into X, we can potentially deck one of our opponents. So if it's down to 1v1, we can win this way. Sphinx's Revelation, Diviner's Portent, and Pull from Tomorrow are also included, but these can only draw us cards. That being said, while they can't be used to deck an opponent with infinite colorless mana, they're still great spells at drawing us cards. So if you are running cards like Thassa's Oracle and Laboratory Maniac, these can be used to deck yourself in case you can't hit an opponent for whatever reason. Thought Vessel and Reliquary Tower are included due to how many cards the deck is capable of drawing into. Not just from these draw X spells, but from our commander. Shodikai is card advantage in the command zone. We're bound to have more than 7 cards in our hand most of the time, especially when we want to keep our interaction ready to protect our commander damage win or our combo win. Speaking of, since the combo requires Shodikai to be a creature, we have to surpass that crew 8. While 3 of its pilot tokens are enough to crew it, that might be too slow in some cases. The deck does run other creatures, especially those that get bigger when we draw cards like Psychosis Trawler and Dream Trawler. With a fat hand, that should be enough to crew Shodikai. However, you can't go wrong with Peace Walker Colossus, Katsumasa the Animator, and Mech Hanger. While they need mana to be paid to do so, they're still animating Shodikai, which is all we need to start the combo. They're also good on their own. The Colossus can also animate any other vehicle in the deck. Katsumasa can make Shorikai progressively larger for a potential commander win, and the hangar doesn't even take up a slot in the deck since it's a land that enters the battlefield untapped. It can even be tapped for white or blue when casting Shorikai, so it doesn't even color screw us. Katori Pilot Prodigy also makes it easier to crew Shorikai by giving it crew 2, making it crewable by Katori herself as well as most of the creatures in the deck, especially just one of the pilot tokens created. Notwithstanding, Kotori can also give Shorikai lifelink and vigilance in case we need some life. We can attack with it first, and since it has vigilance, we can use it to combo off later. Or for just value, since Shorikai is still a value engine, regardless if we're going infinite or not. Speaking of untapping Shorikai for value, Reconnaissance and Maze of Ith allow us to attack with Shorikai, and then untap it at the end of the combat step. Keep in mind that combat is divided into 5 steps. Beginning of combat, the clear attacker step, Declare Blocker Step, Combat Damage Step, and End of Combat. Once we reach the End of Combat Step, damage has already been done. So if we untap Shorikai with either Reconnaissance or Maze of Ith, it's completely legal because Shorikai is still an attacking creature until combat is entirely over, when the post-combat main phase starts. Since it already dealt damage, the damage prevention clause of these effects do nothing. But Shorikai is still untapped. So you can still use Shorikai to attack and then keep it untapped for blocking or value during an opponent's turn. Minamo School at Water's Edge is another land that can be used to untap Shorikai, untapping it whenever we want. 
Unlike Maze of Ith, Minamo does not take up a slot on the deck, since it could actually be tapped down for mana. That being said, the Maze is still good against other Voltron decks too. Rogue's Passage is another great land for Shorikai since it guarantees it getting through for that commander damage. At the end of the day, Shorikai is a 3 turn clock after all, so we can still get a potential kill if we've not yet assembled our combo. Shorikai not only helps us dig further through our library, but it also has Voltron potential as we just saw. However, it's still a value engine since it's also creating tokens and having us discard a card in the process. Idol of Oblivion is an amazing artifact to take advantage of the token created. We just tap it that same turn to draw yet another card. While this might not seem like enough to include it, Unwinding Clock has us untap all of our artifacts each turn. Not only is this amazing on its own to untap Shorikai and our mana rocks each turn, but it can also untap the idol, giving us 3 cards drawn during each of our Tonus turns for just 1 mana each time. So if we're also untapping mana rocks, we can do this each time, which is definitely nothing to scoff at. Skull Clamp also makes the most out of our pilot tokens, making them into fodder for card draw. We can dig even deeper through our deck for just 1 additional mana to equip it. So for 2 mana, we're essentially digging 4 cards deep through our library. Urza Saga is included to not only get Skull Clamp very easily, but it can also be used to get the previously mentioned Library of Lang and Elixir of Immortality, or Soul Ring if we're down on mana. While it doesn't take up a slot in the deck, getting sacrificed after its third chapter resolving will put us down 1 mana, so keep that in mind. Anointed Procession is another way to make the most of the tokens. While there aren't many token creating effects in the deck, the fact remains that we have one in the command zone. Being able to crank out 2 pilots per activation is too good to pass up, especially since this makes crewing Shorikai with them a much faster affair. That and double the 8-8 Krakens from Ominous Seas. Other ways to make the most of Shorikai's ability is via the discarding itself. Containment Construct is included in case you don't want to lose the card. While Library of Leng is amazing, you might not want to slow yourself down by top decking the card instead. However, with the Construct, you can exile the card from your graveyard and then play it this turn, without any limits to how many. You can even discard a land, exile it, and then play it if you haven't played your land for turn. That way you just net drew two cards. Or you can discard a spell you were going to cast anyways. So good. Along the same vein is Crucible of Worlds. Not only is this great at never missing a land drop by using fetch lands, but you can also just play the land you just discarded to Shorikai. Same strategy as before. While this card is great on its own, it's great with Shorikai, but we'll see more on the land synergies later on. Reanimation is another way we can make the most of this discard ability. A Mary of the Sky Ruin can reanimate a creature without even taking up a slot in the deck. It does enter tapped, but it can be tapped for white. We do need to control a whopping 7 planes for it to work, but the deck is running every 2 typed land except for Tundra as I've explained throughout the previous season's deck text. Plus 4 basic planes. With all of the fetch lands being able to get these double typed planes, it shouldn't be that hard. Plus it does it for free during our upkeep and it's not that easy to get rid of since so many players shun land destruction effects. Rhea Dawnbringer and Pulse Mage Advocate also help us reanimate a creature. Rhea herself is quite difficult to hardcast at 9 mana, but with enough tokens and Ashton's altar, it's actually much easier than it seems. Pulse Mage Advocate is much more doable since you could tap it down at instant speed. The only catch is returning 3 cards from an opponent's graveyard to their hand. So if any opponent has 3 lackluster cards in their graveyard, you just reanimated a huge threat. You can even do this to reanimate Rhea herself. Speaking of reanimating huge threats, the deck's running Jingitaxis Progress Tyrant, Jingitaxis Core Augur, and Elish Norn Grand Cenobite. Again, while these might seem a bit out of place and seemingly shoehorned into the deck, keep in mind that they can be hard cast by sacrificing creatures to Ashen's Altar or reanimating them, or just hard cast in a further turn in grindier games. The deck's not green, but it does have ways to accelerate mana, which we'll see soon. The newest Jinkataxis helps protect us by countering the first artifact, instant, or sorcery spell an opponent casts each turn, so it can help us deal with the first counter spell during our turn, or the first of these types of spells in each opponent's turn. He can also copy the first artifact, instant, or sorcery spell we cast. Whatever it is, is going to be value in this deck. The original Jinkataxis is super oppressive because he prevents opponents from keeping a hand while also digging us 7 cards deep during our end step definitely accelerating what the deck is already trying to accomplish. Elish Norn not only helps clear the board of weenie tokens, mana dorks, and hate bears, but also makes our creatures even bigger. Pumping our pilots to help crew Shorikai even easier while also making Shorikai itself a 10-10 when it's a creature, just short of two-shotting someone from the game. If you feel like these are not really necessary for a more combo-centric build, then you can just swap these out for the 3 win-con cards for decking yourself like Thassa's Oracle, Laboratory Maniac, etc. 
As for protecting these engines, we of course need interaction. Fortunately, we're already digging deep through our deck, so we might as well get that sweet, sweet interaction. First off, in terms of protective effects, Padim Council of Innovation, Leonin Abunus, and Bastion Protector help Shorikai. Both Padim and Leonin Abunus give Shorikai hexproof while the Protector gives it indestructible, as well as plus two plus two, which is great in terms of getting it closer to being a one turn clock. While there aren't a ton of artifacts in the deck, some of the combo pieces are artifacts, so it's good to also be able to protect them while also protecting Shorikai. Padim also has the added bonus of potentially drawing us a card during our upkeep. Academy Ruins is included just in case one of our artifacts does bite the dust or if we want to reuse some artifacts. It can also be useful if Shorikai gets destroyed and is getting too expensive to recast due to commander tax. Just leave it in the graveyard and top deck it with the land. Teferi Hero of Dominaria, the only planeswalker in the deck, draws us a card which is plus one while also untapping two lands during our next end step. Not only does this help in keeping mana open to activate Shorikai during an opponent's turn, but to pay for interaction too. His minus three is excellent removal since it bypasses indestructibility and regeneration, especially since it could hit any non-land permanent. His ultimate is quite the emblem here though. Each time we draw a card, we exile a permanent. Full stop. That means that with Shorikai alone, we're exiling two permanents per activation, let alone when we're drawing cards off of our other effects or even during our draw step. He's also easy enough to protect since Shorikai creates a pilot with each activation. This emblem will definitely close out the game with your opponents scooping if they can't kill you before you start exiling their lands. So it's also technically another possible win con, winning by scooping. A Ganjo Seed of the Empire and Odawara Soaring City are some more interactive pieces in the deck that don't even take up slots in it. These cards will inevitably spike once Neon Dynasty stops getting printed, so get them while you can, especially Bo Seiju if you haven't gotten it already. In any case, these are great at stopping an attacker coming our way or bouncing one. Best of all, we can also reuse these later on as lands with Crucible of Worlds if we channeled them, or reusing them with Maloku the Clouded Mirror. Maloku might seem like another odd choice, but he can help us bounce those channel lands in order for us to channel them and then reuse them with Crucible of Worlds. Keep in mind that we can also just play the channel lands thanks to Containment Construct since discarding them is part of the channel cost. In any case, Maloku is another way to create cheap tokens that can either crew Shorikai, jump block, or be used for sacrifice fodder. Since the deck is light on creatures, it's not that much of a stretch to include ways to create tokens. We've also already seen that the deck can win via combo or Voltron, but with Elish Norn and creating enough tokens, we can also potentially go wide, or make everyone scoop if we get Teferi's Emblem. However, those aren't as prominent as the combo or Voltron win. In order to protect ourselves from Horde and Swarm decks, Cyclonic Rift, Evacuation, and Whelming Wave help us by clearing the board of creatures. Yes, we lose all of our tokens, but we're still left with Shorikai. We can then animate it and then swing in unopposed. But better yet is clearing the board of any creatures while possibly protecting our few key creatures. Either way, in case of emergencies, the decks running Wrath of God, Doom Scar, Supreme Verdict, and Vanquish the Horde. These just straight up destroy all creatures. While pretty self-explanatory, I found that out of all options, these are best. Wrath of God prevents regeneration, Doomscar can be cast for cheap if foretold, Supreme Verdict can't be countered, and Vanquish the Horde can potentially cost just double white. That being said, Phyrexian Rebirth and Time Wipe are potentially the best board wipes in the deck, apart from Cyclonic Rift, of course. With the Rebirth, you can destroy all creatures and then be prized with a huge Phyrexian Horror that can be used to crew Shodikai, then can swing in to a defenseless opponent. Time Wipe will bounce one of your creatures, which can then be recast to potentially crew Shorikai, or to just prevent it from being destroyed. Pact of Negation, Swang Song, Negate, Counterspell, Mana Drain, and Dobbin's Veto comprise the deck's suite of counter magic. As mentioned earlier, the main win con is combo, so we have to protect it. That being said, we have to also stop any other combo player from winning too. While you don't need a ton of counter spells, these should be enough. Generous Gift helps deal with any permanent that does manage to get through especially those annoying lands that can remove Voltron commanders from combat. Finally, Mystic Sanctuary is included as a way to top deck any response. It doesn't take up a slot on the deck, it can be fetched for at instant speed, plus it will more than likely enter untapped thanks to all the dual typed islands in the deck. We can also continuously abuse it with Maloku, so it's yet another justification for his inclusion. Earlier I mentioned being able to eventually hardcast our big reanimation targets since the deck isn't that behind on mana acceleration. Obviously, it's not going to do as well in that category as any deck with green in it, but the deck can make do with cards like Burnished Heart, Sword of the Animus, and Sword of Hearth and Home. 
While the heart does require a total amount of 6 mana, possibly paid across 2 turns, it can be recurred with Academy Ruins. So we can potentially get out all of our basic lands fairly quickly in more grindy games. The swords are obviously included as ways to ramp. Sword of Hearth and Home requires connecting, but it does give the creature plus 2 plus 2 and relevant protection. It also blinks a creature as a bonus. While the deck doesn't have any creatures to make the most of it, we can blink Shorikai if it attacked in order to have it back untapped when it returns from exile. Cosima God of the Voyage is included for mana acceleration as well. While Cosima is rarely cast as its legendary creature half, it's still useful as a way to dig through the deck if we're playing a bunch of lands, whether due to ramping, reusing fetch lands, replaying bounce lands, etc. However, the Omen Keel is more useful for the deck since we can potentially ramp lands from our opponent's libraries. It does have to connect, but the deck has ways of making creatures unblockable, plus animating vehicles once the board has been wiped of creatures. It won't always get you a land, but it's still good to include due to it being land-based ramp and not just artifact-based ramp. Speaking of, Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, Azoria Signet, and Talisman of Progress are the rest of the mana rocks of the deck. While we obviously prefer ramping actual lands, these are still great when used in conjunction with cards like Unwinding Clock, as previously mentioned. The rest of the deck is just the rest of the lands. The deck's running all 7 fetch lands, Hallowed Fountain, Prairie Stream, Irrigated Farmland, Glacial Floodplain, Mystic Gate, Deserted Beach, Sea of Clouds, Nimbus Maze, Command Tower, and Ancient Tomb, as well as 4 of each basic land. As with all of my deck techs, you can build your mana base as you see fit, whether cheaper or higher end. The deck will still essentially run the same way. This brew is just an idea of how to build around Shorikai Genesis Engine. While Shorikai is one of those commanders that can be built in so many different ways, you can make it as specialized and extreme as you want. While I focus more heavily on Control and Voltron, there are still some spicy things to do for grindier games since Voltron and Control strategies have their weaknesses. If you're interested in the decklist of this spicy brew of mine, you can find a link to it down in the description. I would like to thank all my patrons for supporting me, and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the Brewers, for their patronage. I'd also like to thank anyone using my TCG Player affiliate link, that also helps out the channel. I also want to thank everyone who participated in the poll that resulted in this video, and the upcoming one as well, so don't miss that one. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of the Brewery on the Commander Tavern. I am the Bedded Kirby, and happy brewing.